this is the second of, of three lectures. And so the, the third one will be on, on Wednesday. And they're, they're sort of roughly interlinked, but they're separate. You should know that all of these lectures and topics were chosen before the events of the past month. However, they are related to, in a sense, unfortunately, what's been going on. And some of that will come up today and some of that will come up uh, on Wednesday. Um, so let me just give you some of the background about uh, this particular uh, to topic. So at McGill, for, for 20 years, I held a chair in Canadian Ethnic Studies. I was studying a lot about diversity in Canada. And, you know, a lot of the, the uh, issues that come up in this study, first of all, there's racism of various sorts that comes up. There's also some sort of benign things, you know, uh, diversity as I'll mention, you know, can be fun or pleasant. Toronto, as many of you know, is considered to be the most diverse city on the planet. Now, some people may be pleased with that. I would, I'm one of those, but others may be less pleased, but diversity is here. And which means that, you know, people have multiple identities, dual identities, and they're probably not problematic. They're not problematic until they are. And then they become problematic. So I want to talk a little bit about this kind of issue. I got interested in the, the issue of dual identity and dual loyalty and even suspect minorities several years ago when I was struck by how Muslim Canadians were being victimized as suspect. And they were being othered for two reasons. One as suspect terrorists and the other suspect culturally because Islam was seen as a, as a handicap by a lot of the dominant discourse, certainly in treatment of women and others. So there was this com combined sort of mistreatment of Muslim Canadians. And a lot of what I will say today, by the way, could also be applied to Muslim Canadians and even to other Canadian minority groups in terms of the challenges, the negotiations of the hyphen, as I'll call it. So let me start with the first uh, picture. <clears throat> the bottom picture is familiar to most of you. It's seen of the Japanese internment, rounding up of the Japanese Canadians and uh, Japanese as you know, and shipping them off into the West. This was a case where Japanese Canadians were deemed suspect. They had a dual, perhaps, loyalties, and we know the result. I can't go into the details of their entire situation. Up on top of the black and white photo is a picture that some of you may or some of you may know. This is a church in Montreal, and this is an Italian church in Montreal near the Jantello market, if you, some of you may know where that is. And there's a picture of Mussolini riding a horse, which is still there today. Now, the Japanese case is, the Chinese case is also interesting. During the 1930s, the Japanese, Cana the Chinese, Cana the Italian Canadian population was supportive of Mussolini, by and large. And this was largely because they wanted to be and were anti-communist and anti-Bolshevik. Came the war. There was a lot of conflict within the Italian-Canadian community. And some several hundred Italian-Canadians were rounded up and sent to a, uh, a camp uh, in Ontario. And they were eventually released when, when the war with Italy was over, you know, and this was, this was a very demoralizing moment for the Italian-Canadian community because they felt they had been victimized and labeled as suspect, suspect Canadians. And now many Italian-Canadians, I should tell you, volunteered, fought, and died for Canada during World War II. We'll come to that. So um, I was intrigued by all of that. And a few years ago, I developed a new course at McGill called Suspect Minorities in Canada, which, you know, 
talked about the various groups that had been labeled, and certainly Italians and Japanese are one. Uh, Muslims, you know, very much so, you know, the most talked about in my class, but the Jewish Canadians also. Suspect minorities, dual loyalties. And I, I'll just end by saying that there has been some debate in Montreal what to do with that picture of Mussolini on the horse in the church. Some of you know that in the United States, people want to cancel uh, controversial sorts of figures, even in Canada, Ryerson, et cetera, right? They're not going to take that down. That's not going to happen. But some people have argued that there should be some contextual writing associated with that to explain why Mussolini is in that church. All right? We can discuss all that later. Okay. So I am interested in the general issue of how we can find space for dual loyalties, dual identities, and to what extent this is a challenge for multiculturalism. And I sometimes call this the limits of the hyphen. What do I mean by the limits of the hyphen? Jewish hyphen Canadian, Italian hyphen Canadian, Chinese hyphen Canadian, Black hyphen Canadian, Muslim hyphen Canadian. This is what multiculturalism has given us. It's given us a hyphen. Are there limits to the hyphen? Most of the time, the answer is no. Look, we enjoy the diversity around us. You walk in the streets, you go into the various restaurants. It's all very lovely and benign. Sometimes there are complications. Sometimes there are complications. And the way in which a society that's liberal democratic deals with those complications is through processes of what we call reasonable accommodation. We hope reasonable accommodation. So laws can be tweaked, laws can be changed, practices can be changed, and we carry on, but they can be very, you know, challenging at times too, right? The most challenging of all is when you move from dual loyalties, right, to, to, to what you call suspect minorities, which I just mentioned in the case of the uh, Italians and the Japanese. So... What happens when the priorities of an ethnic group or even two ethnic groups conflict with national policies in any liberal democratic society, but certainly Canada, which we'll talk about here. Now, you, as I say, you've all maybe heard the mantra, which I like, diversity is our strength. Diversity is our strength. And as I said before, that is true until it's not. And what we have to ponder are how to negotiate those cases where there are troubled, troubles that are serious. And we can decide maybe during the Q&A if, if we're living through one of those moments right now, which some people might call an inflection point. Is this an inflection point? I, I raise that as a question. So limits of the hyphen. And I'm going to begin by framing this in uh, two kinds of literatures. One is a social science literature, which deals with diasporas and uh, transnationalism and things of that sort. And one of them is uh, modern Jewish studies. And in fact, th this is what, what happened at McGill. I taught a course on Canadian, you know, modern Jewish life in Canada, but also a course, as I said before, on suspect minorities in Canada. So I saw the two as being linked in that way. So let's talk about some texts. The Jewish group has been wrestling with the idea of dual loyalties for a long time. In the most modern period, uh, the rise of Zionism as an ideology also caused many Jewish thinkers and scholars and Zionists to ponder what is the link going to be if there is a Zionist option on the table with my loyalty to Britain or France or Germany or Canada. How will that be negotiated? How will that be resolved? Will it be a problem? There's a book called The Zionist Ideas, edited by Gil Troy, a massive, massive book. And he has six themes 
six different kinds of Zionist thought, Zionist issues. One of them, one of the six, is called diaspora Zionism. Diaspora Zionism. It's almost a, a little bit contradictory, but no. The idea is you have Zionists, you have others. How will they negotiate this, this, this dualism? This theme also you can find in writing by Jewish scholars in the areas of theology and uh, public affairs. I just have three examples here. Some of you may know the name. There's theologians named Jonathan Sachs and David Hartman. Uh, David Hartman was a rabbi in Montreal before he moved to Israel, and um, Jonathan Sachs was the chief rabbi of England. Both of them very scholarly, very, I had the privilege of meeting them both and knowing them both, very, very uh, prominent people. They wrestled with this idea from a Judaic perspective, the link between Judaism and Zionism, or Zion, as it was called, Israel. And there was a, a, a prominent, a very liberal Israeli politician named Yossi Balin, for those of you who follow Israel. And so he was also concerned with this. Many people, you could get shelves of books. He wrote a book, give you the title, Israel and Diaspora Jury in the 21st Century. There's no doubt in the mind of Yossi Balin or Hartman or Sachs that this was on the table. This was an issue that Judaism and Jewishness included some relationship between Israel and the diaspora. Okay. <clears throat> some of you are familiar with Louis Brandeis, the American judge, and he I brought something here. Uh, here we go. He was the, the most prominent early American Zionist. Now there, the challenge was really serious. It, it was easy to be a Zionist if you were from Russia, because you weren't a fan of the Tsar. It was also possible to be a Zionist Frankly, you know, if you were from Western Europe, we'll come to that in a minute, but better than the Tsar and, you know, Germany and France opened their doors. Okay. America was the golden in Medina. America was a place where the Jews did not know the old world troubles, but Louis Brandeis. And I'll give you an example. And so I'll just quote some of his comments. <clears throat> the highest Jewish ideals are essentially American in a very important particular. It is democracy that Zionism represents. It is social justice which Zionism represents. And every bit of that is the American ideal of the 20th century. And his most famous quote, perhaps, is To be good Americans, we must be better Jews. And to be better Jews, we must become Zionists. That was the view of Louis Brandeis. I'm not saying one has to agree with it or follow its logic, but that was the view that he asserted. And, and that carried some weight as well. Now, in the social science literature, which is a little different from this more Jewish literature, there is a lot of writing on transnational identities and practices, diasporas. There are books that have been written about this topic. Um, not, not just the ethnic diversity piece, but the whole diaspora, right? I'll give you one example from Canada, Transnational Identities and Practices in Canada, 2006, edited by Satsuwich and Wong, and I have to have with colleagues a chapter in there. And this chapter, 2006 publication, prefigures a lot of what I may say today. So it's not that new. Canadian Jewry and Transnationalism, Israel, Anti-Semitism, and the Jewish Diaspora. Another sorts of texts, which again can have an entire lecture, are the Jewish media. Many Jews in North American Canada are understandably or less obsessed with Jewish media. They read American Jewish media, Israeli media in English, all sorts of media inputs. They And, you know, in Canada, we have the Canadian Jewish News. Some of you are familiar with it. Now, this isn't, this isn't something that deals with Canadian Jewish life. But let me assure you that in the past, and I have it right here if you want to see, the past several weeks, there has been one topic and one topic alone that has consumed all the pages of Canadian, uh, of the Canadian Jewish News and many other 
<clears throat> Jewish periodicals. So these are texts, these are different kinds of texts, but texts nonetheless, which shape a conversation and shape a discourse. So that's why this is, enough, you know, it, maybe it'll come up in my next class. You know, when you talk about anti-Semitism in Canada, that's a misnomer. <laughs> it's anti-Semitism in the world that gets picked up by people in Canada, by media in Canada. And that's why if something happens, in if there's a stabbing in France, Canadian Jews read about it. And it shapes perceptions as well. All right? So, let's look at some Jewish historical examples of, of cases which we would call suspect cases of suspect Jewish identity or certainly dual loyalties. Now let's start with the original such statement, which I think I mentioned in my last class, which is from the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, when Pharaoh is deciding what to do about the Jews, so the phrase he uses is, come let us deal wisely with him. There's a problem. Why were the Jews, they were not Jews, they were Hebrews at the time, why were they a problem? Because, as he as is written in Exodus, because they are growing in numbers, they are multiplying, and they may combine with our enemies to oppose us. So we have to strike them first. It's not because the Jewish worshiping the wrong god or racially inferior or anything like that. no we better strike them in case they strike us first this is one of the essences of being a suspect minority of worrying about someone else's loyalty so that's that goes back 3000 years zooming along we get to the talmud and there's a phrase in the talmud which many people know called dina de malchuta dina which means the law of the land is the law that Jewish people must obey. Dina de Malchuta Dina. Now this is, you know, if you think about it, this is not a very multicultural kind of position. It's that, you know, you, and of course the Jews by then were diasporic and weak. You better obey, smarten up, and you better follow the laws of the, um, of the place where you're living. There are some exceptions to that, by the way, which are interesting. Uh, you know, there are certain certain things that come up where the Jewish person in the diaspora should be prepared to die rather than transgress. It's called in Hebrew, dying al kiddush Hashem, which means for the sanctity of God. You die to sanctify God. And th there's, there's three of them. One of them is idolatry. In other words, if you are find yourself in a situation where you are being demanded or forced or cajoled or whatnot to embrace another faith and reject Judaism, better you should die or die fighting. You know, and you know there there are there are a couple of others, but that's the one that's important for our. You know, if if you have to sacrifice that part of your identity, better to die. And many Jews did die, which takes me to the next example that we have here, which is the Spanish Inquisition, Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition. And in a sense, Jews were presented with that terrible option. And as many of you know, the Jews decided, well, if they, they were either expelled, many of them were killed, and many of them lived as Moranos, which is secret Jews. Now, it's not my idea, but many scholars of the period have argued that that laid the foundation, that idea of the Moranos laid the foundation for subsequent concerns about Jewish loyalty, conspiracy, etc. Why? Because the Moranos were secret Jews. They publicly claimed that they have embraced the Catholic faith. That was the public presentation, but secretly, they lived to a large extent Jewish lives to the extent they could in a, in a basement, in a room, and they therefore were dualistic. They tried to keep one half of that hyphen alive. And when that was discovered, that provoked a lot of anti-Semitism, saying, you see, you can't trust those Jews. You can't believe in them. 
They claim to be Catholic, but deep down, uh, they're not, which provoked another series of rounds of, of expulsions and murders and what have you. But that's the link between the Inquisition and subsequent concerns about Jewish loyalty. By the way, as a quick side note, some of you know that there are some of these people who are the descendants of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews till the present day who maintain secret uh, observances. And you can read about them in various Jewish scholars. You know, they live in Arizona, they live in New Mexico, and you can find them. These are sort of these exotic Jews. They're called crypto-Jews. And, you know, they, 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 they observe one or the other or Jewish custom, you know, uh, my grandmother used to light candles every Friday night. We have no idea why. Right? That's an example. So that's the Spanish Inquisition. Moving ahead, Clermont-Tonnerre, famous uh, uh, member of the French National Assembly, uh, 1789. You know, the Jewish question was on the agenda. The Jewish question was on the agenda. What to do with the Jews? Right, because you know they had been very Catholic. Now they were less Catholic. What do you do about the Jews? So Clermont Tonnerre set the pattern for the French attitude towards minorities. It's not multicultural. It's not intercultural. It's to the Jews as a nation, we give nothing. You want to hang together. You want to be a nation. You want a group. You get nothing from us. But to the Jews as citizens, we give you everything. You want to be a citoyen an equal citizen of France, and I'm going to come to Napoleon in, in a moment. Then, you know, there was a Damascus blood libel, uh, 1840, uh, which was one of the first cases where you had a, a clash between the Jews of a sort of democratic place like France. There was a, a, a Jewish uh, barber who was arrested in Syria, which was a French protectorate, and accused of killing uh, Gentiles to use their blood in the Passover ritual, and it was a, a big universal scandal. French Jews were caught in the middle. On the one hand, they wanted to support this innocently accu uh, wrongly accused Jewish person in Syria. On the other hand, the French government, for reasons of state, was supporting the Syrian position. What should they do? And they were caught. And, you know, it was a precursor to a lot of other things which we will be talking about now. <clears throat> Napoleon. I mentioned, right, the French Revolution, uh, Clermont-Tonnerre. So Napoleon wanted to go further in that spirit, and he emancipated the Jews to a certain extent in France. How did he do that? He convened a meeting of Jewish notables, which some would call the Sanhedrin, which was the former Jewish uh, count, uh, council in, in the biblical times. And he gathered them around in 1806, and he said he could ask them 12 questions. And they better come up with the right answers to those 12 questions. I'm only gonna, I've only put down three of the 12 questions. In the eyes of French Jews, are Frenchmen considered brothers or strangers? Second, what conduct does Jewish law prescribe towards Frenchmen not of that religion, towards non-Jewish Frenchmen? You know, how are you supposed to behave to a non-Jewish Frenchman, right? What conduct? And third, I, I like this one, do the Jews born in France and treated by the law as French citizens consider France their country? Are they bound to defend it? There's the military option. Remember I talked about those Italian Canadians who fought and died for Canada. <clears throat> By the way, Japanese Americans fought and died in larger numbers for the United States during World War II. Canada did not allow Japanese, but and they were the most uh, wounded and most decorated, the Japanese American battalion, doesn't matter. But that's his questions. The good news is, that these notables were not stupid. So they knew what answers to give, and they gave them, right? So in a sense, you could argue that this helped with the process of you know, making the French Jews more equal citizens. And even though there was that 
blip, blip, which I just talked about in 1840, things were seemed to be moving along fairly well at that point as a model of where you know Jews were accepted into the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Oops. Another big problem, the Dreyfus affair, which leads me to try to talk about the role of the military and um, related matters. So one of the characteristics of the Dreyfus affair, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with that affair, is that once again, it raised the question of Jewish loyalty. Here was a, an officer in the French army. Was he a spy? Was he working for the Germans? This is the ultimate challenge for, you know, for, for Jews. The Jews were seen as suspect. What could they do? And by the way, the French, the Dreyfus affair reverberated for decades in, in French society, even to Vichy and perhaps beyond. But that's another issue we can talk about. But so the good news is World War I comes along and the Jews of France and the Jews of Western Europe had a chance to prove their loyalty, and they did. They proved it. They fought loyally for the German army, the French army, the, the English army, etc. What about, and Derek Penzlar, the historian, has written about the, the degree to which there was this loyalty. I will mention again, as mentioned last time, German Jews loved Germany. German Jews loved Germany. They loved German culture. They loved being German. And they fought and they died in large numbers for Germany during World War I. What about Canada? Uh, okay, here's my favorite Canadian Jewish studies book. Some of you may have heard of Louis Rosenberg the father of Canadian Jewish sociology, Canada's Jews. It's a great book. A social and economic study of Jews in the 1930s in Canada. It's a, you know, you can look at it after. It's got tables. I'll tell you, I can't tell you the story of how he did this in Saskatchewan in the 1930s, but he did it. One of the chapters in this book is devoted to the Jewish record in World War I. To what extent were the Jews fighting for Canada, which was really Britain, in World War I? I'm sorry. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. So the answer is the Jews did very well. The, and I'll, I'll give you the numbers. Some people like numbers. I'll give you the numbers. So there were Jews who were involved in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. They made up 3.4% of the total of those people. Already a good percentage. When you look at the decorations, the medals, the decorations, the honors, the Jews made up 4.5%. So they were more represented in the, um, even in terms of getting awarded honors or, or whatnot. So they were very loyal. Canadians. Now, Louis Rosenberg, when he wrote that book, very clearly says, you know, people might have thought that Canadian Jews would not step up. He didn't use the word step up, but you know what I mean. But he wanted to show that they did, and they did. Some of you may be familiar with Ellen Bessner. She's someone who has written a book recently about, what it, the, and the title is very interesting, Double Threat. Canadian Jews, the military, and World War II, looking at the, the record of Canadian Jewish involvement in the Canadian army during World War II. And she finds a very strong, strong record of, of involvement, of volunteerism, of fighting, of medals. And she also makes the point, I think it's an important one, that, you know, she what does double threat mean? One threat was you're fighting the Germans, you're fighting someone in the Japanese, whatever, that's the enemy. But the other threat was internal to the Canadian army. There was unfortunately a significant amount of anti-Semitism that a lot of the German, a lot of the Canadian soldiers had to deal with, even as they were fighting together. 
And this is something that she tracks in her book. But the point is, never mind, Canadian Jews in World War II stepped up and they fought and they died in expected numbers. No dual loyalty there. All right? All of this issue, by the way, underlies the most famous and infamous book of anti-Semitism that there has been, which is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Underneath that book, which is, you know, what is the book? The book is the rec recorded minutes of a secret meeting of Jews in, in Switzerland to plot to take over the world in 1897. That, in one sentence, is what this book is. It's, it's the recorded minutes right, of this secret plot. It's a secret plot. It's a conspiracy. The Jews aren't loyal to any of these countries. They're loyal to a secret Jewish conspiracy. And this idea can be traced and found in all the subsequent examples that we have of, of you know, Canadian sort of anti-Semitism, uh, the Zundel case, the Keegstra case, I'm sure you all know of that, also have the notion that Jews cannot be trusted. They are, they're manipulating. Uh, Keegstra thought the Jews were behind the scenes manipulating all the events of the past 200 years. Right. So again, there's no loyalty there, according to these people. Okay. So the Jewish diaspora and Israel. Let's focus in on that particular case. The Jewish diaspora is really an iconic case in the field of diaspora and transnational uh, studies. This has been true up until 10 or 20 years ago, when you could see a shift away from the study of the Jewish case in terms of diasporas, in terms of multiple loyalties, what have you, because Jews were thought to have become white, and therefore they were not a legitimate subject of concern. What I'm going to try to suggest later on is that, in fact, the Jewish case remains very relevant to every kind of diasporic minority group in Canada or elsewhere. Um, first, there have been studies of Jewish lobbying. Now, lobbying is not limited to the Jews. Every minority group has its lobbies. Many of them, to be quite honest, look to the Jewish group as a guide for how to do it. I have been at meetings where that has transpired. Okay, can we, the Jewish lobby is seen as very effective, at least in Canada. Whether, whether that's true or not, that's another lecture, but is it effective? So um, there's a book called The Lobby written by Mearsheimer and Walt, which is about the pro-Israel lobby, which argues that the, they're, they're smart. They don't use the word Jewish lobby. They pro-Israel lobby. By the way, there are more evangelicals in that lobby than there are Jewish people in that lobby. But argue that you know that has been harmful to American interests. There you go. You have a Jewish lobby or pro-Israel lobby, and its activities have harmed American interests. I can't go into how he makes that argument. But the issue is there, and there have been other books. Looking at Canada, for example, there was a book published 30 years ago, The Domestic Battleground, by Taras and uh, Goldberg. Some of you may know that book. What was it about? The Domestic Battleground. It was about Canadian Jews and the Middle East conflict 30 years ago. A series of essays about precise science. So these have been issues that have been prominent. If we look at the, the Jewish diaspora in Israel, we can't not talk about the strong cultural and social ties that one finds with diaspora Jews, including Canadian Jews and Israel. All kinds of ties. Again, you know, we can round up the usual suspects. How many people have visited Israel? How many people uh, speak Hebrew? How many people, uh, you know, have relatives or whatnot? It, it goes on. There are all these connections, and they're very, very strong. So I would argue that the evidence, the empirical evidence, is very strong, that there is this ongoing social and cultural tie. If you look at the curriculum of Jewish schools, 
except for the ultra-Orthodox yeshivas, you will find Israel is an important element in that curriculum. Jewish children are encouraged to, to go, or they are sent to Israel. It goes on. There are, e there are even high, uh, college programs, as we all know. If you add this stuff all up, it's a sense in which Israel is part of the formation and the socialization of many of these North American Jewish children. More than other similar groups. There are some groups that are trying to get up there, but you know, I had a student once who was Korean who told me that the, the South Korean government had programs to help Korean children in Canada visit. Now, I don't know if they were free programs, but they were heavily subsidized. Same sort of idea. I want to talk more about the Ben-Gurion Blaustein correspondence of 1950. What's that? So when Israel was created in 1948, there was a lot of concern by many prominent Jewish leaders about this dual loyalty issue. Oh my God, what's going to happen now? What will they think of us? Zionism says Jews have to go to Israel. But what about our ties to our country where we're at? So, Jacob, you see the photograph there? There's uh, Ben-Gurion and Jacob Blaustein. They sort of look alike. but that, yeah. Anyhow, Ben-Gurion decided to communicate with Jacob Blaustein. Who's Jacob Blaustein? He was the president of the American Jewish Committee. The American Jewish Committee was a very powerful organization, but it was, uh, it, it was not Zionist. It was not anti-Zionist, it was sort of non-Zionist in the United States, 1950. But they tried to figure out how will we solve the dilemma of being Jewish in the United States, but also having this country, Israel. How, how will that work out? And they came up with a solution. Here it is, very simple. They agreed that the American Jewish community would not interfere with Israel's life, with life in Israel, Israel's policies, what Israel was doing. And at the same time, Israel would not interfere with American Jewish life. The two would be separate. There'd be no interference and therefore no problem of dual loyalty. That was the blouse. did not last long, and for a very long, a lot of interaction between the North American Jewish community and Israel, and Israel into the North American Jewish community. Uh, sending of, well, just a lot, uh, sending sort of representatives of, from Israeli youth movements into Canada. Uh, so obviously, both countries are interested in the elections of the other countries. Sometimes the diaspora likes the Israeli government more. Sometimes the diaspora likes the Israeli government less. And Israelis are always monitoring less Canada, but certainly the American government. Who's going to be the, you know, I'm sure they're already, someone's drafting plans. What are we going to do if Trump gets reelected? Which is not unreasonable. Could happen. Whether you want that or not, that's, a, that's a, but people are concerned about that. That's the Ben Gurion Blaustein correspondence. Now, in Canada, <coughs> there have been some acute cases which have been interesting. So there's the question of dual citizenship. This is an entirely interesting issue dual citizen. Do you want a political leader of your country who is a dual citizen? Wait a minute. Is that is that a... many of you may know in the Italian Parliament today there are seats reserved for people of Italian origin who are not from Italy but they will represent the Italian diaspora in the Italian Parliament. Same thing for France, by the way. Uh, for right, you know, for better or for worse, that exists. Right, there are seventy, at least seventy countries in the world that have ministries or agencies devoted to their diasporic uh, 
uh, communities. By the way, Mussolini was a pioneer of that. He was very active in projecting Italian influence in the 30s to the Italian diaspora. Okay, little side note. Okay, so, you know, we, NDP, the Thomas Mulcair had a French citizenship, so his Jewish wife, you know, Prime Minister Harper, when all of this stuff started to come out, very clear, he says, in my case, I'm very clear, I'm a Canadian and only a Canadian. No dual loyalty worries for uh, Prime Minister Harper. There, going back a little further, there was a famous episode in Canada in 1988. Joe Clark was giving a talk to something called the Canada-Israel Committee, 1988, and he made some critical comments about Israel in 1988, and he was booed. He was booed. And um, this caused a fuss, and various newspapers commented on citizen the citizens of Canada back and in a public statement they said uh, the star, by questioning the loyalty of Jewish Canadians, has crossed the line from criticism of Israeli policy into anti-Semitism. Does that sound familiar? If current debates, criticism of Israeli policy, dot, 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 anti-Semitism. Okay. Now, there were other studies that looked at this in greater detail. My colleague Hesh Chopper is here. So he and I wrote a book in 1988. My God. Okay, 1988, called Old Wounds. An important title, Old Wounds, Jews, Ukrainians, and the Hunt for Nazi War Criminals in Canada. The Old Wounds came from something that the judge Jules Deschen said about this case. The Canadian Jewish community had for some time tried to see if they could do something about Nazi war criminals in Canada. I can't go into it. We wrote a whole book about it. I didn't bring the book, but I bought the jazzy title. <laughs> jazzy book cover. The old wounds. There it is. And there's our pictures. God, we were young back then. <laughs> All right. So that was a case study of Competing loyalties. It was a case study of competing loyalties. Um, the Jews versus the Ukrainians and both versus the government. And both the Jews and Ukrainians had to navigate those loyalties. It could have been worse. Eventually, there was a report released and not much was done about those alleged Ukrainian Nazi war criminals. But that was a case study of what of when you know these diversity is not a strength when it's a problem. Now, if you read, remember the news two or three months ago? It seems like ages ago when there was that ninety-eight-year-old fellow who was honored in the Canadian Parliament. He was a Ukrainian Canadian fellow who was a member of the same uh, division uh, uh, that was the subject of this inquiry. All of a sudden, people were remember. Oh, yeah. Whatever happened, you know, why is it why is Canada honoring this 98-year-old guy who was involved with a division of the SS? He was not a hero, not a war hero. He was a member of a division of the SS, Ukrainian division of the SS, back in the day. But then, of course, the events of October 7th made that issue a little less relevant. Now, Hesh Chopra and I also, 35 years later, decided to look at another uh, issue, which is the issue of how Jews, going back to the pre-war period, how Jews have dealt with conflicts with the Canadian state. How have they done that? And in fact, there's two paradigms. One is sort of the accommodation paradigm, and the other is the militancy paradigm. And so 
the title of, of that article, which was published last year, was, was uh, from Stadlanut. That's a Yiddish word meaning uh, a wealthy Jew who begs the monarch to, to help the Jews and, and forgive the Jews and not be nasty to the Jews. Please, Stadlanut, to never again. A transition from the supplicant to never again. So we looked at these various um, uh, topics in some detail in, in an article. I just want to see the time. Okay. So Nazism in Europe. This is before the war. There was an attempt to get Canada to boycott the Olympics of 1936. Failed. And then there was the whole none is too many episode about Canadian complicity. Then there were debates about the creation of the state of Israel. By and large, the Canadian elites were okay with the creation of the state of Israel, with some minor exceptions. Neo-Nazis in Canada. Some of you Torontonians may remember that in the early 1960s, there were some uh, youthful neo-Nazi uh, groups that were organizing here in Toronto. Uh, there, there was uh, the CBC interviewed uh, guy named George Lincoln Rockwell, who was the head of the American Nazi Party. And so the Canadian Jewish community, what should we do? What are we going to do? We don't want these Nazis speaking and, and, and mobilizing and having demonstrations. And what's interesting is that there was tension in the Canadian Jew. How do you respond to that? Should you use some quiet diplomacy or should you go on the streets and make a fuss? The Soviet Jewry campaign, some of you may know, lasted for several years. Again, same issue. How can we help the Jews of the Soviet Union get out of the Soviet Union? What can we do? And again, there was an idea of having more conventional diplomatic efforts, but at the same time, there were street level demonstrations, right? Some people here may have been involved in some of that, whatever, you know. And eventually, Soviet Jews were helped. Israel advocacy. Throughout the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, there were all sorts of, Canada was always supportive of Israel. In broad strokes, always supportive of Israel. For right, better for what, the supportive. But there were periodic cases when that support was shaking, like votes in the UN. So there'd be some times when there'd be a vote in the UN and Canada, instead of supporting what Israel would do, would abstain. And for many Canadian Jews, this was seen as problematic. What do you do? How do you negotiate with the government? Usually it was a liberal government. How do you pressure the liberal government to do what's right? Lastly, we talk about uh, not the federal government, but the government of Quebec. And there is a very interesting example of the same issue. You have a Jewish minority in Quebec. You have the Quebec government making not explicitly anti-Semitic uh, policies, but policies which many Jews opposed. Okay, and um, and which indirectly seemed to harm Jews. Just most recently, there's this policy with regard to the English language universities. Nothing specifically Jewish about that, but many Jewish people who live in Montreal would be very upset are very upset with that kind of policy. But this also goes on. Do you use the quiet diplomacy approach to try to get the Quebec government to be more accommodating? So the Canadian Jewish Congress, the Quebec branch, goes to Quebec City, and, and you testify, and you show your goodwill, and you franchise the schools. Or do you try a more militant approach? And there were some groups of Jewish Montrealers who favored that more militant approach, and they would attack the conventional political elite and saying, you know, you're not, you're too weak, you're not strong enough. So you put all that together, but what is clear is that for 40 or 50 or 60 years at least, this has been an issue in Canadian Jewish life. And where you defend your interests, but lurking lurking are you really supportive are you really are you really a quebecois like we are do you really belong um you know why are you so at, 
advocate, well, you know, what's that Joe Clark thing indicator? You know, can't, can't we criticize Israel? Why, why can't we criticize Israel? Okay. This went on for a long time, and Canadian Jews had to navigate that, and they did for a large time. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes goes back to the debate over Ezekiel Hart. Familiar with Ezekiel Hart, the first uh, Jew elected to the uh, uh, what was the Lower Canada Assembly in 1807. Someone there was opposition to him because he wanted to swear on the Bible. Uh, on the he didn't want to swear on a Christian Bible. It was a big deal. So one of the letters says, "By what right can a Jew who is only worried about himself and his sect expect to look after the interest of the whole nation?" How can you be a good uh, supporter of, of, of our people if you're a Jew? Not an Israeli, but just a Jew. I want to mention something about the role of Erwin Kotler. It's a very interesting case study. You all know of Erwin Kotler, a distinguished track record within the Jewish community, but within the academic community, and certainly within the liberal party. Now, I should tell you, I don't go into it here, that he was the recipient of nasty anti-Semitic uh, emails and, and, and comments. But that, that's but his view was very simple. There is no distinct no distinction between between being a good Jew and being a good Canadian. There is no debate. You're a, it, it's like a kind of a, a Louis Brandeis idea. Remember I, I spoke about that earlier on? Now that is true, and I agree. Happens, really. I'm not speaking of major dis Jewish community. Will they be charged as they were in the Joe Clark thing? You know, you are citizens of Canada. You're not citizens of Israel, which is a very nasty kind of thing to say. So I'm now going to talk about something called the British Tebbit test. We're going to end on this. What is the British Tebbit test? In 1990, there was a, a member of the British Parliament, conservative, named Norman Tebbit. And he was worried about integration of minorities into England. Big worry. So he said, and he was very worried. Why? Because if there was a cricket match between Pakistan and England, the P Pakistanis in England tended to root for the Pakistani team. And his argument was, this is a failure, and we will only have successful integration when the Pakistanis in England will root for England, then they are true members of our community, which is silly. And he got blasted for that. It's really silly. But I thought about that. So I've been talking now about serious kinds of issues that come up or could come up. The Middle East issue. There. What about a, a, a Tebbit test for Canadian Jews. Do Canadian Jews feel they really belong? How much comfort is there? Is there for Canadian Jews in Canadian life? Which is actually relevant now because some Canadian Jews are wondering about the upsurge in anti-Semitism and wondering what, what's that all about? So I did a survey. I surveyed a number of prominent Canadian Jewish individuals from all walks of life, many of them people who, uh, whose names you might know. And this was the question. And it's a trivial question. It's a funny question. All right? Suppose Israel and Canada are competing in a gold medal Olympic soccer game. Who would you root for? Now, the good news is that will never happen. <laughs> that this is not going to happen. I wish it would happen, but it won't. So who are you going to root for? So this was a qualitative study to gauge the response. How would people deal with that? Really trivial. And to my surprise, this question, which is kind of a jokey question, caused a lot of consternation and ambivalence and discomfort for the people that were posed. So the majority of the people that were asked refused to choose. They cannot choose. I will not choose. I won't choose. Whatever. And the rest divided between Israel and Canada more for 
Israel and fewer for Canada. I would root for Canada. And I've just given you some examples of the tortured reasoning that they offered to try to explain what they were up to. I would just enjoy the game as a Canadian. I would be disposed to support Canada, but on a psychological level, I would support Israel. I couldn't answer the question of who I'd be rooting for. That would be too binary for me. I don't have a yes or no answer. Only an intellectual will come up with that kind of thing. It's too binary. Um, I would be somewhat conflicted because I would be I would be happy either way. It's like Keats's negative capability. Only a media personality could come up with that. And I, I used to know what Keats is, but I, I've forgotten. So could tell me. And a rabbi supported Israel, but claimed he would bring two flags to the game. Right? Now, this is silly. What is it? If there is a kind of conflict of this sort on such a trivial, fun question, what would happen that was not about a soccer match? Okay. So where are we now? So in 2018, 36% of Canadian Jews said Canada was not supportive enough of Israel. This is in the Bob Rim survey. By the way, and I don't comment on whether these are right or wrong. That's what it was. 79% of Canadian Jews are very or somewhat attached to Israel. Now, this was done several years ago. I have no idea what a current serious survey would find. But there clearly is this idea among the Canadian Jewish population of an attachment to Israel. And one interesting thing that I know some colleagues are debating about, do you think the recent events in Israel have weakened that attachment or strengthened that attachment? And, and that's something that maybe will come up in the Q&A. Okay? But the links and conflicts between dual identities, loyalties, are latent and they persist. They may be latent. There may be some sense of latency in which these insecurities that the Jews are others may suddenly have emerged in this current situation. So dual loyalties today, what are the boundaries? I pose the question. What are the boundaries between loyalty to Canada and loyalty to Israel? And I hope you realize that the same question could be posed to other minority groups at this point. Right? That's clear. To what extent are these issues, these whole dual loyalty, uh, suspect minorities, conspiracy, are, to what extent are these foundational challenges, are they linked to current anti-Semitism in Canada? There's a lot of talk about current anti-Semitism. And by current, I mean in the past few weeks. So is, is it accurate? Is it overblown? Is it uh, minimized? And how do we relate that to the whole question of loyalty, identity, and considered possibly suspect? That I'll talk about on Wednesday. But I think I'll stop here. And thank you very much. And maybe there's time for Q&A.